Is there another screen we're anywhere? We're going to count to ten and assume that we're good. I think we're good. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the March 22nd, 2018 New Market School Board meeting. This is the board's reorganizational meeting, so they'll be taking over in a minute, but we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the, of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, members McKinney and Alberg are not able to be with us tonight, so we are going to move to reorganization. Um, before I do that, I will ask if there are any public comments that folks would like to make. So I think we're moving ahead to our student report piece, and that's yes. great. We'll invite you to come on up and go ahead. On the behalf of the New Market Swim Team and our teammates who couldn't be here tonight due to prior commitments, we would like to thank the school board for such an amazing opportunity. Yeah, we really had a great season this year and we're really excited for our team to grow and we look forward to the next season, so thank you. I would also like to thank uh, the Oyster River who was able to take us in and give us all kinds of resources and really take us in and teach us the swim world. I Would you do us a, a quick favor and just introduce yourselves and tell us what uh, events you compete in? I'm Lucas Russell, and I did the one-meter diving along with the 50 and 100 freestyle races. I was Zoe McGurk, and I competed in the 50 freestyle races, the 100 freestyle races, and I competed in a 100 breaststroke race. I'm Taylor Kennison. I competed in the 500 free race and the 50 free and also the 100 fly. I heard that there were some um, excellent performances this season from all of you guys. Can you guys expound on that? I know it, you probably don't want to brag, but I would love to, <laughs> to allow you to. <clears throat> Taylor, maybe you can yeah. start. I hear so some records. So two of us went to states. Lucas went to states for diving, and Alex went to states for um, freestyle. So that was really amazing for, to have two of us go to states this year for the first year. So that was good. I, I sat through a few of these meets, and what was it was a couple of me where it, it was it was almost standing room only. They were so crowded, mm -hmm. and uh, I was really um, impressed by the poise of the new market kids, the sportsmanship. Uh, Lucas, I. I um, my, my back muscles and neck muscles hurt watching you dive. I don't know how you do that, but you did a, you did a great job. Thank you. And a great job at States, too, and a great job to all of you. But I, I, it, it was a great experience. I, I, you know, the full crowd cheering, you know, it's, it's uh, and, and I also want to thank the Oyster River coaches who treated our students as if their own. So it was, it was, it was good. It's, it's neat for us to see, you know, from, you know, I know um, town resident Nicole Benson sort of fostered this idea and started it all and was the champion for it and met with um, Mr. Hayes at the, the junior senior high school to get it flowing and then it was brought to us and, and it's amazing to see you guys here with the season over and with the success that you've had in terms of school records and qualifying for states and everything and so it it's one of the times that um, I'm proud of what we do, and we're proud of you guys for the hard work that you've shown, the dedication, and the sportsmanship. So keep up the good work, and come back in the future and tell us more. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we will now move to board reorganization. Are there any nominations for the position of school board chair? I'd like to know. Any, oh, excuse me, do you accept? I do accept. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none. All are, are there any comments people would like to offer? Great first year. Thanks for, uh, for jumping in. Um, you provide great balance for us. As a, as a chair, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kim, I there's so much that happens behind the scenes in terms of scheduling, in terms of dealing with personalities and dealing with crises that arise, you know, that, that folks don't see. 
and, and I don't think you get enough credit for, um, but you really handle it with uh, professionalism and, and um, wisdom, and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's been an honor. Right. May I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to elect uh, Kim Shelton as um, chair of the school board for the coming year. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I abstain. Thank you very much. Everyone, <laughs> the motion passes, and now I hand you the gavel and move <clears throat> over my seat. Okay. <laughs> The next order of business is to, and you guys can stay there if you want, is to um, elect a vice chair of the school board. Any nominations for that position? I'd like to make a nomination of Mike Kennison for vice chair of the school board. Mike, do you accept said nomination? Um, I would recommend, and I, I'm serious about this, that we defer until the other board members, we, you can, um, we can go at, at risk without one for a couple of weeks and okay. deal with it when uh, folks come back, if that, that makes sense. sense. Sure. Makes sense to me. So we will defer, we, um, I seek a motion <coughs> to defer the election of the vice chair until the next regular business meeting. So move. Yeah. Motion for Mr. Kennison, second for Mr. Zink to defer the appointment of a school board, <coughs> election of a school board chair to the next regular business meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 So that will be held on the April 5th meeting. Um, moving right along, we will proceed with our agenda, going back to one of the things I wanted to say before we go to you, Catherine, I apologize, I'm all over the place, totally just fine. newly elected, trying to get my feet under me. Um, um, anyway, um, we, there were more people at your inauguration, by the way, than other previous ones. It was a huge crowd. See, Mike, you're taking me down a road. Anyway. Um, we just had a non-public session with Chief True uh, regarding school safety. And um, one of the things that has happened in the town over the past couple weeks is that Meredith and the administrators at both the elementary school and the junior senior high school, as well as the school resource officer, Officer True, I mean, Officer Steven, Detective Stevens, excuse me, and Chief True have been meeting, they had two meetings with parents in both of the school locations. And um, I attended the meeting last night, as did um, Mr. Kennison. And from what I have heard, the feedback from people last night and the night before is that, and myself as a parent, feel so grateful to have a unified team of administrators and police officers who are serving and striving to protect our kids every day in our schools. I think we have a uniquely beneficial and special relationship between the police and the administrators in our town um, that all the five people that presented to us last night um, had an honest and true dedication to and concern for the safety of each of the children in the schools that we operate. And that, as a school board member and as a parent, makes me feel pretty good about things. Um, I'm grateful that Chief True sat down with us. Um, he always gives us a unique perspective as school board members in terms of safety and, and, and issues there. One of the things that we discussed um, as a part of that meeting is whether or not it makes sense uh, for the board to decide to place a second school resource officer in the elementary school. So it would be a full-time person similar to Officer Stevens in that school to increase the safety of the staff and students there. Um, and you know, we, there are logistics involved in terms of how that works, in terms of hiring a person and finding the appropriate officer to do it. Because, you know, one of the things that we talked about is that, you know, that's a special school. Both of our schools are special schools. But when you're looking at five-year-old students, um, you know, we need to have the right person in there who um, demonstrates a positive interaction for police officers in terms of safety and concern and all those things. And so, you know, Meredith is going to work with Chief True in the weeks to come to determine logistically how this could happen. We need to figure out as a board funding sources for it. Um, the plan at this point is to sort of look at those things in the next few weeks before our April 5th meeting. Um, we would welcome any feedback from um, the public that's watching this, either to the superintendent's office or to the school board, to talk about your feelings about this or concerns or support of it. Um, and then 
if we choose to go chose to go forward, it would happen on the April 5th uh, regular school board meeting. Is there anything that I missed from our meeting? Any point that I, that you feel that, that I need to address at this point? You know, I, I am just grateful for our police crew and our administration and for their dedication to our students. It, it, it makes me feel so much more confident as a parent and as a school board member. I, um, I would want to thank, you know, Officer Stevens and, and Chief, uh, Detective Stevens and, and Chief True for, for filling us in last night on, on um, security and, and answering questions. Um, it's, it's not uh, an easy thing to talk about. Um, it's certainly relevant. Um, I would say right now as a school board member, having listened to that presentation and, and been involved in, in other discussions about security, I, I right now wholly support the notion of a school resource officer down at the elementary school um, and um, want to do whatever I can to make that happen and, and move that along. Yeah, I think we're, we're extremely fortunate to have uh, Wayne as our school resource officer. He's noted in the New Hampshire, New Hampshire area and beyond is a real resource. Um, and you can see it in his eyes when he talks about uh, the, uh, the whole issue of safety. Um, and to have a cloned Wayne sort of Wayne 2.0. Wayne 2.0 would, uh, I think, serve this country, serve this community extremely well. Um, so I'm going to, as a school board member, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to uh, to encourage that we hire somebody as soon as we possibly can. It's so tough, you know, as a parent, as a school board member, to watch these events occur on the news because every time it hurts my heart that there are people that are involved in these ways, and I. I am sad that we have to have these conversations and we have to do lockdown drills and we have to do those things, but the fact is we have to do them. And we need to be as prepared as possible, I feel. Um, although you can never be completely completely safe in all ways or prepared, but I think we need to be as prepared as we can at this time with the information that we have. So that's what we're striving to do. All right. Catherine, would you like to proceed with the rest of I the student report? So in the elementary school this week, they were having Unplugged Week, which is a really great way to get kids engaged through other outlets rather than technology. I was able to go to a few of these nights and I'm able to go to the Friday one, which is the wild robot dance, which I'm very <laughs> excited about. It's great to see kids engaging in music, in art, in watching productions and just finding other ways to stay occupied and to have fun, which is really cool. Where is the uh, robotics? Uh, this is this is the wild robot dance for elementary school students. Robotics uh, is competing next weekend, the 30th and the 31st. So. At oh, UNH. I totally missed it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so that is also happening. But, but, the, but there, was a, there was a robotics thing. Yes, the robotics team will held be it competing at UNH at on UN the 30th and 31st. Right. Next yeah, the robots they're building are really wild. They just <laughs> they just have to lift up all six feet, is it, and then put it in a. It's yeah, a lot of different, good different different hard programming, but I think you're making different, fun of me. Different. Just <laughs> <laughs> trying different robots. Different robots. <clears throat> Which is also a great program, mm. um, and that's what I was going to address in my high school account so there's a robotics meet <laughs> the 30th and 31st at UNH um, there's an interact bake sale tomorrow right after school which goes to the interact students um, they're currently sending one or two people into Texas for hurricane support during April vacation which is really great so that money goes towards helping those students go to Texas with some money and helping the people down there who suffered from the hurricanes, which is really cool. There is a National Honor Society event called Dodging for Charity, which is taking place on March 30th at 4 p.m. at the elementary school. Um, kids from the high school get to form their own teams and choose a charity to kind of play for, and the winning team will decide which charities the money go to, which is really cool. And 
it's five dollars at the door and that money will go to whatever team you're rooting for which is a cool way to make money for each of the teams there's also a pizza bowl going on march 30th which is hosted by the class of 2022 or 2020 Mm, one of those <laughs> sorry <laughs> and that's at 6 p.m in the high school cafeteria on tuesday march 27th there is awards nights for boys basketball and that's 7 p.m and april 6th there's a junior high dance in the cafeteria and a mr newmarket pageant in the gym for sports the winter sports had a really great season and that includes swim team, indoor track, boys and girls basketball, and hockey. Um, boys basketball had a final record of 14 to 4. Girls basketball had a final record of 10 to 8. Hockey had a record of 6 to 12. And now we're moving into spring sports, which is going to be baseball, softball, and track, which is a really fun start to the season. The first game for baseball is April 9th at 4 p.m. at PCA. Pending melting of snow. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> Tentative dates for softball <laughs> are April 10th, 4 p.m. at PCA, and the first track meet is in Laconia, April 5th at 4 p.m. I think that's all I've got. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I went to the uh, championship basketball game up in Plymouth, and um, you know, just uh, I wish I could catch more sports, but just kudos mm -hmm. to the coaches and the team. What really impressed me again, I mean, everybody wants to win, right? But was the, I mean, you know, I kind of watch out for the sportsmanship issues. There were mm -hmm. kids that got fouled hard and went down, and there were new market players there that, that helped them up on the on the opposite team. I mean, I think that is just reflective of the coach, the class of the kids. So uh, that was it was really nice to see that. Close game. Yeah. <laughs> Very close. Meredith, I was going to ask if you would not mind deferring your report and allow us to have the program of studies to come up so that can be presented. Be would, how does the board decision. feel about that? Feel about that? Mr. <coughs> Mazzani, would you like to come talk with us about the updated program of studies? I would be delighted. Which I don't have it. <coughs> It's my understanding that uh, we forwarded, you all have received electronic yes. copies, um, which hopefully has given you time to formulate some questions, some feedback, some opinions. Obviously, the, this process, sort of just to walk you through, goes through multiple drafts. Um, some, of the, some of the more poignant changes I sort of highlighted in a separate document. Right. Um, we spent time, if we remember back to a previous meeting, talking a little bit about involving some of our competencies and, and how we're aligning our curriculum to those standards and competencies. Uh, you'll see a lot more um, of that reflected in this draft of the program of studies. We tried to sort of, uh, uh, obviously, while increasing our, you know, our rigor and our relevance, um, you know, throughout, uh, also bringing some of our language uh, more into a more consistent place and, and sort of talking about some of those pieces so uh, like I said rigor and continuity among all curriculum areas were certainly some focus uh, pieces uh, one of the biggest things you'll see is that beginning with the class of 2022 which is next year's freshman class that'll be our first heterogeneously grouped um, class of students um, again as we uh, draw back to some of our previous discussions it sort of it sort of falls in line with some of those things but competency-based education doesn't necessarily drive heterogeneity or homogeneity um, again we're sort of the expectation for us is that our teachers are providing rigor um, to all classes and to all ability levels uh, throughout and uh, some of those models for a unified arts and art teacher uh, if anyone's seen our, our band and concert performances those are great examples of heterogeneously grouped kids who work really hard together with, you know, like I said, rigorous instruction and high level um, practice. And, and they come together for these great performances at the end, which is not unlike what you'd expect at the end of, you know, an English course or a math course. Um, so I'll highlight some of the major changes. Obviously, I, I believe there would probably be some questions. Um, 
uh, one of the things with the class of 2022, you'll see that the level designations were updated. Uh, again, that uh, our, our basic thought behind every student that walks out of our doors with a new market diploma is that they're college and career ready. So even what used to be called our L4 level, um, we've sort of, we've, we've worded that to reflect the rigor that's in all of our classes um, and the expectations that we have of all of our students to be ready for life after high school, whatever that entails. Um, those level designations, which have been updated on page 21, will no longer apply beginning with the class of 2022, um, which lends itself to some questions, what about sort of those AP classes, those honors classes, those still exist. Uh, and as kids mature and grow and get older, they'll sort of take different pathways. And if we remember back again to previous meetings, some of those talks about personalization of instruction and learning and those pieces is where you find those pathways to, to learning and to graduation and to sort of finding your way. Uh, page 10, <coughs> one of the other changes that, that sort of bears some focus is it now reads four credits of math rather than math each of the four years. Uh, some of the purpose behind of that, uh, some of the, a lot of the drive behind that is again, we were seeing some of our students who are you know, getting engaged into pre-algebra and algebra at, at the middle levels, right. and that's a great thing. Uh, so boxing it in to say you've got to take it each of the four years, we may have students who you know, may have topped out of our program of studies. I'd like to see us really enhancing some of those electives uh, and some of that rigor. So we've got juniors and seniors who are continuing to challenge themselves and you know, maybe uh, see less free blocks and more um, running start credits. Um, students who might, you know, we're starting to engage in pathways with the university system um, to start saying, okay, hey, you know, I could, I could come out of high school with some, some college credit under my belt. And, and those things are really important. Not only are they cost effective for families and students, but they, again, that, that rigorous piece there for kids who want to continue learning. And again, it's learning, not earning. Um, we're really sort of reflected throughout this iteration of the program <coughs> of studies, which will continue to change. And again, I think a program of studies, a good one is a, is a living document. Uh, and you'll see changes as we go. I think at some point it will look like, with this class of 2022, it'll almost look like we'll have simultaneous program of studies running as we, as we work one in and, and one out. Um, beginning with the class of 2022, another place that I'll sort of um, focus on is you'll notice that our freshman writing course, which was required of all freshmen um, uh, in the last program of studies, now is going to be more, uh, it's recategorized as an elective, and we're going to look at some of our student data to see how students should be placed in that. So it's more sort of bumping up that instruction and helping our students, as we've looked into some of our student data, become better and more competent writers. Uh, and again, that's dropped into an elective credit. You're still maintaining that four credits of English, um, which can look really different for a lot of different kids and, and, and as we grow and as we offer more electives and, and more rigorous electives, you'll start to see the classes such as science fiction or, you know, um, Brit Lit might be some courses that you may have, you may remember from your own program of studies that we'll start to be able to, to kind of weave into even in our small school. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, page 29, I think, is a place that uh, it's sort of been long overdue. That's our digital, digital literacy section. Um, we did a crosswalk, and I give a lot of credit to Ms. Boatwright, who's um, our lone computer teacher at the high school, for really looking at the competencies and what students are doing at SST through some of their digital, digital media and digital arts program, uh, as well as Annette Blake, our art um, department chair. And we really looked and said, where are some places here that we can increase rigor and get kids ready for that 21st century? Things like coding. Um, and, and things that you hear a lot of. We took our computer essentials class, which uh, was a class that all typically was, was populated with freshmen. Uh, we're looking at those standards now and saying, these are standards that fifth and sixth and seventh graders may already have or may need to hone. So we've taken some of those standards and we're bringing those down into the middle levels uh, of computer essentials and that it does two things. One, it sort of meets kids where, they're at, where they are, but it also allows us to offer them more rigorous electives uh, as they matriculate. Um, and it allows for more of those sort of uh, 
independent study pieces, so more interest-based pieces, some more extended learning opportunities. So uh, I'm really excited <coughs> about um, what I think are, are the beginning of um, what we'll see is a lot of 21st century types of experiences for kids and and all the while and I know when we sort of talked about position shifts and things like that maintaining those electives maintaining the rigor and making sure we weren't losing the things that made our school really special were really important to us uh, and I think you'll see that reflected throughout the document that we shared last week so in a nutshell I mean that's a, a 60 page document that I just sort of went through in about seven minutes so Certainly, uh, I'm sure there are questions. The thing that I saw throughout the document, Chris, and, and you've hit on it, is really the paradigm shift <clears throat> to starting with even the heterogeneous classroom. Because if we really are getting to a standard-based situation, I could be sitting at a room in a room with Mike, and he he and I could be working on two different things because he's light years ahead of me in math, as I'm sure he would be. Um, and I think it, it's setting us up for to have that happen in a successful way and to, to have people be individually as select as 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 successful as they can be and as a group so as successful as, as the group can be um so i think that that's exciting i think you know it's sort of when I, when you're talking about having two courses of studies i sort of thought it, you know when you go into a college you have the handbook that you or the, the 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 book of classes that you get when you come in and you are bound to those rules but something might change in this case a year later but you're still bound to the original rules but they, the, the books work concurrently, the catalogs work at the same time. So I think you know, that's a, a, a paradigm shift also in terms of you know, getting people thinking on a different level. Um, you, know, you are in the class of 22, I'm in the class of 21. Things have changed for these reasons um, to keep us all as competitive as possible and to keep the rigor where it needs to be so that people are prepared for college and or, and or career, depending on what they choose. Chris, thanks for putting this together. I, I went through it, and uh, it's very readable. Um, I just had a had a few questions, and some of them um, uh, Chris Andrisky might have covered in his presentation. I unfortunately wasn't there, and I haven't uh, gone back to watch it yet. So, pardon me if I'm going over old ground here. Um, By all means. So, um, one one of the things the the first statement on your summary page it talks about reviewing competencies to reflect a, a high level of rigor. Um, what are we comparing that? I mean, how do we make those comparisons? How do we know if our level of rigor is, is where it ought to be? Um, are we looking at other schools? I'm sure we're looking at, um, you know, resources, uh, uh, you know, cutting edge uh, uh, ways to teach and, 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 and looking at what colleges are accepting and what, what kids need for careers. I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we know when we're at the right spot? You sort of, that's probably three or four really great questions. Um, and and I'll, I'll start at the beginning, and then if I sort of get lost in the weeds, bring me back to some of your, your, your questions. The I first one that I already, so. The, the, <laughs> the first one that I heard was how, how do we know um, that we're sort of at that rigorous level? And so, exactly um, what we did, you know, we start with some of our cohorts in the area. So, we'll, SST for us, the Seco School of Technology, is a great place to start because it has a lot of schools in our catchment area. Uh, so we're able to sit and look at some of the classes and courses that they offer. Um, you know, I'll use engineering as one because that's a pretty good jumping off point for us to look at some of our math courses, to look at the standards uh, and the expectations between their pre-engineering courses and some of our math courses. And then we'll sort of take a step further and look, um, you know, what are our area schools in the SST catchment area, how do they assign levels of rigor? And so there's some comparison there. What took us sort of a second step was to look outside of our catchment area because within that um, heter heterogeneous grouping um, isn't a statewide uh, piece yet. So we looked at some of the two of the more high performing schools that heterogeneously group Oyster River uh, Middle uh, and the high schools uh, also there but also uh, Sauhegan High School. So those were two program studies that uh, were really helpful in terms of sort of matching and taking a look, see where we are, see where we need to be. Uh, so those were two examples of, of heterogeneously grouped schools, but also looking at our schools that are more traditional based or traditionally based that are within our area. And for me, it was really important for us to also look at schools that were close uh, in terms of demographics and size. Because you know you could look at some of your larger schools and their course offerings, 
uh, may be more vast, uh, and that's okay. But the depth and the rigor are what are most important. So uh, what we've done, I think, a tremendous job of, and, and I, I sort of, when I say we, I don't, I think I, I, I thank Chris for this. We found avenues in a small school by, you know, using some online <coughs> help, by partnering with some of our other schools, um, by using our, our opportunities at SST to help kids find pathways. So we may not be able to offer 15 sections of AP English, um, but we may be able to offer those rigorous electives or those other pieces that, that students are interested in because there's more opportunity out there for them. So I, I, I hope that sort of covers some of what we compare to how we compare. Your other piece, which I think was the last piece in a typical uh, form, I heard the first thing and the last thing, I'll have to bring it back to the middle one. Uh, we started this year with all of our college admissions counselors that came in with our guidance counselor who's been collecting um, from them. And it's, uh, it's been sort of a break for a lot of people, and myself included, who was used to the traditional model. Each college sort of assigns, after talking to your guidance counselor, they do their own calculation uh, as to how rigorous they think your course of study is, how rigorous they think your class is. Mm -hmm. So each school, real, I shouldn't say each, but a lot of schools have their own formula for how they'll weight uh, what courses your graduates have taken, how rigorous they are, uh, what electives are offered. So, so that does actually vary from college to college, and that's uh, something we can talk about in depth more later. Uh, Mr. York's uh, been collecting that sort of anecdotally as our college reps have joined us. Uh, and as we've checked around, that's been the answer we've got. Um, and then bring me back to the middle question, Mike. I, th I know yeah, those I were the I, two. You covered everything on that, but just led to another question. In, in um, how, how would the colleges, uh, how would the colleges know how uh, rigorous, you, you know, New Market's program is? How, I mean, without having you know been through it. I mean, we can call it. I don't know. I'm level six, uh, uh, algebra two. How do they know what that means on, on, on the ground? The short answer is they're more likely to look first at how what are what are our standardized test assessment performance. Right. What's that data look like? I see. And they're going to use that to sort of look across the board at schools as a more holistic comparison. Gotcha. And okay. then they sort of adjust from there. Okay. Um, in addition, they're really looking at what is that individual putting on the table? What's the quality of that essay? What's the information? What are activities is a student involved in? Mm -hmm. How is it, what passion has he or she, you know, devoted numerous hours to? You know, what's driving them to apply to their school? So it's it's both and. Mm -hmm. They are interested in knowing, you know, what rigorous courses has a student taken, but essentially they're sort of taking the school's word for these are the most rigorous courses we offer, but they're assessing that objectively through other means. A lot of um, uh, uh, top tier schools <coughs> now are asking students to submit portfolio documents, videos, demonstrating like who they are, what, what drives them, sharing projects that they've developed, talking about extended learning opportunities yep. they've participated in. Um, I think that's, that is going to grow as we move forward, but right now I would say the standardized assessment data is the common link still for a lot of schools. Has Sauhegan and um, Oyster River, who have gone to the heterogeneous model, uh, noticed a difference in their test scores? So Sauhegan's been heterogeneous since it opened. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, if you look at their trends, they're traditionally pretty high achieving on those performance assessment results. Mm -hmm. Um, Oyster River has seen its most noticeable growth in math um, with some changes that it made. It was uh, historically doing pretty well and again it's been heterogeneously <coughs> grouped for probably going on at least a decade at this point. Um, but even within that they made some recent changes at both the middle school level that have continued into high school in mathematics and saw about 50 point on average um, SAT growth. This is, this is a rising tide raises all boats type of deal? Is that, I mean, it, it having instead of? That's what data has shown historically. Yeah. When you, when you uh, reduce tracking structures, historical tracking structures, everyone does better. But again, every community has to look at their own information. And it's not a lifetime commitment. It's constantly about reevaluating how are we doing. Yeah. I, I could have you here till midnight and then tomorrow night and still be talking about this. but just. 
a, a related question from the teacher's perspective. Um, uh, how, do, how does this change their day-to-day -day view? Are they, is this something, uh, that, that, is this like a teacher's dream? Would they rather have this? Or would, you know, and then there's no one right answer because different teachers will say different things, but. There's not, there's not a right answer. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the right answer. Yeah. Um, and I think it would vary from teacher to teacher. I think I, I, middle school teachers, this has been our reality forever. Um, they, I think you look at some of your unified arts, uh, art, and I think I mentioned music before, <laughs> some of those other ones. Is it everyone's dream? <clears throat> no. What does it require? It requires uh, more in-depth planning. It requires a level of differentiation for, to Kim's example, I've got to teach Kim math very differently than I teach Mike math. Yeah, um, and, and, and that's in a class of 18 uh, and 16 and 20. And so it does require extensive planning. And it requires us to look at what our data is telling us. Are we, are we hitting the mark? How are, you know, are we hitting our targets? Are, are we setting appropriate targets? So um, it's, it, there's a lot in the planning. Uh, and supporting through that. And one of the things you'll hear a little bit about, we are supporting our teachers through, there's a few really big items up that are upcoming uh, in terms of classroom instruction and instructional practice that we've applied for grants and been accepted uh, into a, a couple of different consortiums to sort of help folks grow in that, in that way. Uh, that said, um, Teacher prep programs, I think uh, the last time we talked, uh, we, I think we said 52% of our teachers happen to be in their first five years with us. Uh, teacher prep programs are now sort of putting a lot of emphasis on um, differentiation and how to, how to individualize teaching and learning for students in, in heterogeneous classes. So that's one of the advantages to having a lot of new teachers. This, this has been sort of their world. Um, so that's, that's a nice side piece. Chris, is it, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think also, even in the leveled classes, there are different levels within the levels. Absolutely. So there's heterogene, heterogene, heter, heterogeneousness, which is not a word probably. Heterogeneity. Heterogeneity, thank you, <laughs> in those classes today. I have today. to practice it a lot. Um, so I think that that's happening every day today because level six is 20 different things depending on for 20 different kids in the class or where's level five, you know. So I think it's happening. I think it's well said, and I think if we look even too at, at our sort of traditional and where we've been, you know, we go back to that discussion about standards, and you look at that L4, which was what we would have said the, the, the lower level designation, we would expect every student to reach the standard regardless of level. And, and so the, the depth and the rigor rises with that level, and so we've always ex had high expectations for our students. Uh, we expect everybody meets sort of that minimum, and then you've got kids who exceed and excel, and you've got kids who need to remediate. And you know that doesn't mean do it over. That doesn't mean right. you know depth and rigor doesn't mean you know if I'm in this class I gave you an extra book. It meant it means we went deeper with this book, and so we you know that's sort of a different way of looking at it. How, how does the, how how might the um, the grading or assessments work um, under under this model under the heterogeneity? Heterogeneous say. grouping. Heterogeneous grouping. Um, how does that work? Uh, you have you, you go to a heterogeneous model. It doesn't mean you change kids, right? That you have maybe some kids who are overachievers, some kids who, you know, are at a different. Uh, how, how does it work on, on a particular class? I mean, how do you grade a essay? In a competency-based model, you don't. You say, are they meeting the standards or are they not? And you give feedback around what areas need to continue to grow. It's not an ABCDF. Uh, you know, it, it's it's again looking uh, looking at the bigger picture, um, and that's a paradigm shift. It's if you take a swimming analogy, it's I give me as the coach giving you feedback on how to improve your stroke, as opposed to saying. You're a good swimmer or you're not a good swimmer, mm -hmm. right? Which is more valuable to you as a swimmer, giving you the feedback on how to improve your stroke, right? Giving you particular techniques. And that, that is part of the presentation that Chris and Chris and the team went into um, at a, one of our recent meetings. But, but I, that's a piece of it. But it's also about, again, K-8, this is what we've always done, right? As a, as a person who was a English language arts teacher, I had non-readers, really, in my class teaching eighth grade, and I had kids who were reading at the college level. And I had to grow all of them. I wasn't going to bring my non-readers, probably, to an eighth grade proficiency level 
in one year, but I was gonna help them make growth. They were still gonna make growth maybe as writers, even if their reading wasn't growing as quickly. Um, and my college level kids, my job was to make sure that they were continuing to grow and reach and extend as well. And those writing pieces looked very different, but I guarantee you every single one of them got quality feedback and instruction about how to grow. And, and that's really what RTI has been about in our schools, again, going back over a decade at this point. That's the work. We have a responsibility to meet the needs of all of our kids. As we've talked as a board about personalization, you know, that, that's the buzzword, but again, We've always had a variety of kids in our schools with unique needs, and it's always been our job to meet the needs of all of those kids. And it doesn't look the same for every single one, and it never will. One of the uh, things I, I, I react to as I look through this is it looks more like a college course offering uh, um, presentation than it does what I remember is uh, counting one when I was in high school. Let me try to explain that better. Um, uh, let me just take principles of marketing, for example. And it says an introduce, introduction to marketing approaches a subject as a scientific decision making involving multiple considerations, economic environment, consumer behavior, product planning, pricing, promotion, distribution, and market research. That sounds like a college course description to me. And my question is, mo many of us in our third year of college didn't have a clue what we were going to do. And I'm, I'm wondering how, and I know you talked earlier about getting people out into the community and having them work at Seacoast, you know, have them work at the machine shop and all that. Um, so what's my question? My question is, I, I think it's great. I think it's, it's mature and it's broad thinking, but how can a 10th grader or an 11th grader think about marketing um, that early in their, their life? I think it's a valid point. And in that way, I, I would say, and again, this is sort of philosophical, but kids haven't really changed. Um, but I think back to me as a 10th grader, um, maybe I thought I was interested in marketing. And I challenged myself to sort of take that class and partway through it, I said, you know what, marketing's not for me. But I was still exposed to a, rigor, a rigorous curriculum. And I said, you know what, this isn't for me. And I, and I changed courses. Similarly, you do the same thing in college. You get halfway through a major and you say, you know what, this isn't what I thought I wanted. Um, and we're allowing sort of people to do that while also having access to high levels of rigor and meet the state requirements sort of in a way that's meaningful and engaging. So um, I don't think kids have changed all that much. And, and I, we have a lot of conversations with 10th and 11th and 12th graders where I'd say, even if I asked you right now, what do you want to be when you're done with school, you may not be able to answer. And that's OK. And, and the reality is, for most of our kids graduating today, it's going to change probably eight, ten times are the projections uh, in terms of their actual careers, not in terms of their mm. what they perceive. But their actual careers will change. I know Catherine was meeting. I Please. think the early exposure is a really big part of it. I think y when you're exposed to something early, like accounting and marketing, you may not be able to grasp all of the context right away but just having that exposure to real world situations that are going to help in the future accounting definitely helps with budget planning and um, going through taxes in the future being able to look at how you're spending your money and look at the wisest ways to be spending your money and really having an exposure to that is definitely able to prepare someone much better for college life or for their actual adult and career lives as they're growing. So I think having that type of program is really, really helpful. And having the level of complexity at probably a younger age than some people may have gotten it in the past is a really great way to expose kids and make them more college and career ready, make them more life ready, and having those skills, being exposed to those skills really early on is really good. 
Well, one of the things I've learned since I've been here, and I think Catherine's a great example, is we ask kids and we listen to them. And, and I think for a long, long time in traditional education, we sort of put on them what we thought they could handle. And we started asking them, and we realized they could handle a lot more than we thought we were putting on them in, in a lot of cases. And so, Catherine, if I can put you back on the spot, if you want to talk a little bit about your experience with Spanish Five right now, yeah. that opportunity that you had, because I think this is a really sort of good example. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, of course. Um, if you could explain sort of where you are with Spanish Five, um, because it's a great example of sort of, it kind of encapsulates where we're what we're talking about. Sounds like she can probably do it in Spanish. <laughs> sí. En español, por favor. Así que el año pasado. So last year I was taking a Spanish three course and my teacher picked up on the fact that I was kind of bored in class and that I had really grown fluent and I was watching TV shows outside of class, Spanish soap operas and great things. <laughs> and um, she really realized that I wasn't being pushed to my full potential and she brought up the suggestion of having me go through the Spanish 4 course in my last semester of Spanish 3 and then working on an independent study course in Spanish 5 the next year since that wasn't really being offered. Um, and right now I'm able to make all of my own curriculum. I just finished doing a research project on um, gender inequality in Spanish countries. I was able to have a half hour Skype call with someone completely in Spanish, one of my teacher's contacts, and it's just a really great way to build your own curriculum and learn and be pushed. I think for a long time in those classes I wasn't being pushed and it was kind of stunting my potential in the language and in does just learning in general so it was really cool to have a teacher who picked up on that and realized that I could be challenged more and then came and asked me how can I challenge you more how am I able to get you to that bigger potential that I see in you which was just really great and it's been a very positive experience this year and Catherine's an exceptional young woman but we have many students who feel that way mm -hmm. in school you know, on, on a regular basis, and that's not an indictment of our teachers, but it is an illustration of why we need to personalize, you know, children's learning experience, create opportunities for students like Catherine to design, you know, projects that are of interest to them and that are engaging to them. Um, I, I had a conversation today I met with Ryan Lavasser, our Extended Learning Opportunity Coordinator, and our guidance folks at the junior senior high and we were talking a little bit we were reviewing the policies around extended learning opportunities and um, uh, online courses and how all those pieces fit together and they had forums and they've been building out a website and the big piece of the conversation was this is where education is heading and I would say to us as a school district if we're not moving in that direction we are going to lose students whether we like it or not choice voucher systems those things are moving forward i believe we can meet the needs of our children educationally but we're going to need to continue to, to give them choices the question that came back was well what's that mean for our teachers that means our teachers have wonderful opportunities to serve as <coughs> coaches and advisors how great to have a student who loves your content area who wants to pursue it deeply and engage in conversation and pursue like a, a gender inequality study in spanish-speaking countries like what a great thing that would be so exciting for me as as an educator i don't teach spanish but <laughs> but hey I, I would be so excited to help that student our teachers are going to be serving in a much more coaching role we have the right number of teachers to do that with the student population that we have. I don't see that taking away jobs from teachers. If, however, we aren't adapting, we aren't personalizing, we aren't giving kids choices and opportunities, we're going to lose students and then we are going to lose teachers. And that's not, I don't think, in the best interest of New Market. The, the thing that gnaws inside of me, and I'm showing my age um, for sure, um, but you know, the fundamental concept that I want somebody graduated from high school that has a good grasp of math, has studied literature, 
has studied a foreign language, um, knows U.S. history, knows European. I want I want to send out of this school this well-rounded person that can. So, that's what worries me a little bit is. Um, I choose that I want to do Spanish five, and um, whereas it sounds terrible for no. me to say this, but but are are are, are we going to miss something because she doesn't have an inclination to do European history? So in a competency-based world, and we'll talk about the graduation requirements policy later, but no. And in fact, Catherine probably came to us as a ninth grader with those skills already in place. And so how are we challenging Catherine to be the best Catherine she can be? And that's our responsibility. Uh, you know, I, you, there's always more to learn in European history and in literature and in mathematics, right? You can pursue any of those full-time as careers and constantly be learning. But Catherine probably could have demonstrated competency in most of those areas as an incoming ninth grader. And I, again, I'm not singling Catherine out. Right, right, I don't right. think she's alone in that. In, you know, students come to the table with all sorts of different skills. We also have students who come to the table without those skills. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be spending probably, uh, they're not going to get elevated to Spanish 5, right? It may take them four years of high school to get through Spanish 1 or through Spanish 2. And that's OK, right? They may also have a wonderful talent in uh, biotechnology, right, that, <laughs> that they're pursuing at the same time that they're fulfilling those fundamental requirements. We're not saying kids don't have to meet basics and fundamentals, but we're saying that uh, that's, that's the floor, right? We want to help kids move to the ceiling. And they may be coming into high school <clears throat> better prepared than 40 years ago. Different. Differently prepared. Different. Yeah. And, and things have changed. And, <clears throat> and again, I think Meredith said it, that, you know, that's still our floor. Um, you know, our requirements are, are still, you know, you still are required your, your four years of English. You're still required for credits of math. You know, your lab science is, and we, we're one of the only schools that requires all students take chemistry. Uh, U.S. history, civics, those are all still required courses. So, so to your point, Al, those traditional pieces so that people can be sort of baseline functional, um, whether they enter college or the career world, those will still remain. We're just allowing for and opening opportunities and doors for pathways for, for people who want to sort of stretch that. Uh, if there's an area of interest, let's say if I use the U.S. history one and I become a poli-sci sort of person, which would have been my my thing you know now you're looking at okay I want to go beyond street law now I'm able to sort of maybe I'm doing ELO at a law firm maybe I'm you know working with a paralegal so so the baseline is still there we still want competent 21st century learners we want kids who are able to think and critically analyze problems and problem solve on their own uh, along with having that baseline of, of all the pieces that that we expect people to be able to do and you know to be able to read the paper to be able to fill a job description to understand when I go buy a car what compound interest is, and uh, do I need do I need air conditioning, or, or can I just go without? And you know, so make some of those kind of choices in the in the moment. And, you know, those are those are. Sounds like grades might become irrelevant, right? I mean, if it's competency based, why, you know, versus age based, or um, it's about learning, not earning. Yeah, um, this is good stuff. Can we can I ask three more questions? Twenty seven subparts. <laughs> we're, we're, this no, this, is, this, absolutely. this really it's is. It's nice to talk about education. Is, yeah, I mean, exactly. it, so. the conversation, and, and I, I, I'm joking, Mike, but yeah. absolutely, because this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is, this is, you know, we talk about the building all the time. We talk about safety, which we must talk about, because that's a <clears> fundamental <throat> thing to allowing the education to happen. But this is what we're doing, and this is what you guys do. So, yes, this I, I love just, these talks. Just, just a couple. Because I learn a lot. More questions. Um, um, it, it, this is a granular question. On page 10, it, it talks about um, uh, the, the, the introductory paragraph. Uh, New Market uh, high school courses are a half a credit if they're a semester, whereas Seacoast uh, SST classes are one credit per semester. Has that always been the case, or is that something new? 
Yes, where you where um, Mike top of the page it says high school graduation requirements on SST courses meet daily and we meet every other day. That's the yes. reason. Yes. I got gotcha. you. Yes. Okay. And so our block schedule would be A B. Uh, our math classes do meet every day though. Okay. So that's a full credit. Um, <clears throat> literally two more questions. This is such a uh, an important and paradigm changing thing. Um, I'm sure you, we've thought about this, but what is the communication plan to parents and um, you know uh, it's it's it seems it would seem to be require a, a great this is it's a paradigm shift yeah, yeah. so uh, looking towards probably the third week in April we'll have mm -hmm. the first and if, if if we need to do more we'll do a similar form to what we did with safety get more into the details with what this looks like specifically for the class of 2022 and I think the catchment piece will be with with our initial group of next year's ninth graders and I think it is really important and we want to we want to get it right and I think for me personally getting through this discussion first was was important I wanted to make sure that we all sort of came to the same place before we were ready to sort of do it together with our parents and community. I've had a lot of parents sort of come in and, you know, there are pieces that are out there and already starting to ask great questions and we've had some coffee chats and things like that. So they've happened on individual levels. Um, but I think now once we move past this as a, as a team, I'll feel better about standing in front of larger groups. I see, I see an incidental benefit that with this as well that um, I, I have personal experience here with over the past weeks and months, I guess, is this this, this um, unhealthy uh, competition or ranking. I think it, I think I think I think it's more about the parents than the students. That, um, and I know I know it's yeah. It it, it, it it's it was it's really strange. Uh, I think it's from a benevol benevolent point of view that, that certainly parents want their kids to do well and be competitive and all that, but. Um, too much energy, it seems, is, is, is tied up into uh, rank and... Uh, um, Mike, I will say, my yeah. high school, and I was there decades ago at this point, was just ranked 12th in the country. Mm -hmm. In 1989, when I graduated, there was no class rank mentioned, period. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we had too many people who had weighted 5.0s, and they couldn't determine who was number one. Right. And so they just took it all off the table. Um, that was, you know, and all of us got into very competitive colleges and there was no conversation of class rank ever. Yeah. So it's just a different paradigm and shift I, I, there. I read about this, this, this case in New Jersey recently where a Superior Court judge's daughter was co-valedictorian and he brought a lawsuit <clears throat> to crazy. Up, like, get it, yeah, and then her, her life was essentially ruined. Um, <laughs> so, That's um, crazy. oh, last question for now. I'm, I've got a ton more, but we can continue it. But is... Uh, so you have the, the VLACs and you have the VHS courses. How um, we're still going to offer those in the in the competency based, and how do we bring that into the fold? I mean, are those, those are still going to be graded courses. I mean, how how do we? Um, they that's there's sort of a transitional piece, and if again when we go back to that standards when we talked about competencies and standards, the the last piece will sort of that will change will be how grades are reported, um, and so. VLACs, VHS may continue to grade in a you know an AB manner. Uh, they may make this shift as well. I, I don't have an indication either way today. Um, at that point, that'll be we'll we'll run through a similar I would imagine um, calculation as our college admissions counselors do. We'll say okay, the rigor of this course, they may assign it, and we may say this is you know the course they took is uh, I'm trying to think of one that's off the top of my head that's a VHS course that. Uh, AP Psych it actually is a good one that we don't offer in-house, um, but that would still be AP is its own thing. And so no matter what school you go to, AP writes its own curriculum. But um, right now I have a student who is taking a creative writing course uh, in, st in the stead of the freshman writing course. And um, so VLAX will weight theirs, you know, in a way, and we'll sort of look at that. The most exciting thing for me in your conversation about weighted grades is the elimination of that weighted grading system, in my mind, has people taking classes for the right reasons, yep. because there's passion for them, uh, and they want to they want to sort of gain knowledge rather than gain points. So mm -hmm. I, I'm excited for that piece and that unhealthy competition that you spoke about. Is Chris uh, one thing that I think might be helpful, and, and the board can help me with this? You know, I think that 
um, presentation that you did on competency based grade based grading really gave us a good foundation of things. But I think you know even for us, there it might be appropriate for us to revisit it with us. You know maybe in the time frame that you're rolling it out to parents, so that we are fully understanding if, if you'd be willing to do that and Meredith we can figure that out timing wise we, we talked about that when they came the first time yeah that we're supposed to be back in May part two right. was going to be coming and so they are slated did. to come so, back and so I think the I think the board um, has a has a shared responsibility here in terms of getting the word out to go to the I forget what the date was Chris in April uh, I haven't said it yet said it'll it? be the okay. third week but the week before vacation but we're just trying to find something that doesn't conflict with Everything else. I think maybe one of the one a frustrating thing I would think Meredith for administrators stuff is, is you know you can post it and you can put it in the newsletter and stuff and, and people will still say I never heard about it you know so I mean I think we can do what we can on you know what you know on our yeah. own efforts to, to, to spread the word and tell people to get out and, and, and listen and ask questions and when my my last uh, a, a light kind of came on here a minute ago after listening to Catherine about. Um, We're lucky to have her. Yeah. Um, one of the, I don't know what your plan is, um, but boy, as a parent, if my student would have come home with this package, just like you presented it now, and I sat down and I read it, and I said, boy, I've got some ideas on marketing as a parent. Uh, by the way, I, I am a mark. I'm right. not. But um, yeah. it would seem to me that a discussion, I'd love to sit down with uh, one of my kids and talk about this wide variety of things that are available, why they might be interested, mm -hmm. and why they, um, to, for involvement and excitement. And um, I don't know if your plan is to send this to parents. We, these are available online, how, how the process typically unfolds. Uh, our eighth grade guidance counselor works through the eight to nine transition with current eighth graders, and that's sort of already begun. Uh, our, high, our high school counselor works with each individual grade level and parents uh, as they do the course selection piece as well. And sometimes they pick a, you know, this is my interest level, and sometimes it changes. Um, but those conversations, the size of our school, um, the interpersonal relationships, and how well we know our kids um, sort of lends itself. A lot to those of kinds of conversations, it it depends. It depends on the family, just as you'd expect. Um, it, I would say an appropriate amount of parent involvement for some kids. Some need more parent involvement than others. Some don't. I'm thinking of a student right now. We're talking about Yellow's. Uh, He's, a, he's an amazing filmmaker, and, and I'm looking at how there might be some opportunities through the University of Southern California um, filmmaking school to achieve some writing credits uh, for his senior writing. So there's, I mean, that's just one example of Ryan Lavasser's uh, treasure uh, of trying to sort of hunt some of those things down, um, because I think we could all agree that college level screenwriting course certainly is a rigorous course that 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 could perhaps take the place of or at least realize a, a credit of English for a high school student that we might not be able to offer based on size. So it's really our job to help sort of be detectives and look for opportunities for kids that are interest-based that still, to your point earlier, make sure they walk out with the basics. Any other questions? Um, thank you, Chris, again. Thank yeah, you. I could go on all night, but thank you. You know, and, and I like I said, we, we look forward to you coming back again for <clears throat> the second part of the um, competency-based piece, you know, sort of developing it further, because I know you guys are still in the process of doing some of that, so hearing more about that later on. Great. Um, the next item on our thank agenda, you. thank you, Meredith. The, the, at some point, you need to approve a program yes. of studies, oh. and then um, that can be now or later. Though it was connected, but I know that we also want to talk about the eighth grade field trip. Um, I'm feeling from the board that they want to defer the vote on the program of studies until the next meeting. Is that what I'm getting? It makes sense because because we're missing two members. Al. Sure. Um, Does it? Is there? A, are we up against I, I, the I would just note we had to cancel our last meeting, and and part of the reason we had sent it out ahead of time was so that we could try to make that decision tonight. Um, it is somewhat time sensitive in that course selection needs 
to move forward. So if that's the case, I would. I'm we can prepared. Go. Okay. Yeah. I seek a motion to approve the course of study presented us by Principal Mazzoni this evening. So moved. Second. A motion for Mr. Zink and a second for Mr. Kennison um, to approve the course of study. Is there any discussion? Thank you, Chris, for the hard work. Thank you all for your time. Um, we'll, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of approving the course of study, say aye. 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 It's approved. <coughs> the next item on our agenda, which is not the next item, but the next item that's going to be on it, is the approval of the eighth grade field trip. Thank you for being patient yeah. with us. Yeah. Interesting. It was a good conversation. <laughs> um, my name is Lindsay Malsbury. Um, if you don't already know me, I'm the eighth grade science teacher. And I'm here tonight to seek the board's approval for eighth grade field trip, as you guys know. And this year we are trying something new. We are taking the kids to the Hidden Valley campsite um, at the Griswold Scout Reservation. We're going to leave in the morning of Wednesday, June 13th, and we'll return in the afternoon of Friday, June 15th. So this year's trips is going to focus on communication, team building, and self-reflection. At this point in the year, all academic standards will have been taught, so therefore we're really going to focus um, on real life application of communication and self-identity. So the questions we're really looking to address is how do I resolve conflicts um, while communicating effectively? How do our actions affect the world around us? And how can a positive self-reflection help us become more successful in our present and future? So to address these questions, students are going to participate in a bunch of challenge activities, hiking, and numerous team building um, events. It's our hope that students will find connections between their in-school curricula and the natural world around them. For those students staying at home, we're going to offer a series of day-long activities that address the same focus as the Griswold Scout Reservation. The curriculums for those students staying at home are modeled by the outcomes that were given to us by Griswold. Uh, so this way, all students have equal opportunities to access the curriculum. Uh, the cost per student this year is $130. So students are required to meet all behavioral expectations in order to attend. We currently have six students in need of scholarship, totaling $632. So with the help of fundraising, we have reached our goal. So all scholarships are taken Excellent. care of. And um, we're here just tonight to seek your final approval. And we are super, super excited to bring our kids. Sounds like a great program. Yes, I'm very excited. Um, and I think that team building and sort of um, self-reflection is so important as they move into high school because those years go by fast, as we yes. all know. So I think it's <laughs> good to, to carve out that time to talk about that. Any but other questions about I'd like it? To make a motion to approve the eighth grade field trip. Second. And a motion for Mr. Zink and a second of Mr. Kinnison to approve the eighth grade field trip. Is there any discussion? Just an apology that we kept you here so long. No, no worries. I, like I, I said, it was it's interesting. It's my mistake. I wasn't even thinking. <laughs> no, do not worry about it at all. <laughs> all right. We'll move to the vote then. All those in favor of approving the field trip, please say aye. 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 It's Thank occurred. you so much. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Thank you. We hope that it goes well. <clears throat> all right. The next. Next, we're going to move to Meredith, if you'd like to do your superintendent report. Okay. So I'll back up to note um, first that the school budget was approved last week by voters. It was. Um, I have for you the MS-22, which is the school board essentially attesting that these dollars are the dollars we recommended and that have right. been approved by voters for the upcoming year. So there's a blue pen with that for your signature. Um, Safety was a hot topic. We've had two um, parent forums. We talked about this a little bit at our last school board meeting. Um, great turnout at both of those. Uh, again, with our conversations, it's something we hope to make an annual event. I think we, um, we've been working with school safety for uh, including lockdown specifically in schools for almost two decades at this point and so i think for those of us who work in schools it's just a, it's just a part of the work we take it very seriously uh, i don't want to underestimate that at all but we forget that not all of our parents participated in those lockdowns when they were in school, that they don't understand how some of our training has evolved as we've learned from, sadly, um, previous school shootings and safety incidents that have occurred around our country. So it, it was a great opportunity to hear parents' questions, explain to them what the work is that we do, how we talk to students about safety, 
the culture that we strive to create in our schools, the relationships that we strive to build with students so that students are known, people feel safe speaking up, um, all of those variables that make, make a difference for us. So um, we did talk also about the role of parents in an emergency situation and um, one of the pieces that came out and um, we don't talk about where our offsite evacuation locations are. And we don't do that because we want to keep that confidential because it's an added safety measure. In the event of an actual emergency, we would be communicating to parents where to, where to go, where they could meet their children. And again, we know that in a crisis and emergency <coughs> situation, all of our instinct is to get to the people we love. That's where you want to go. But in the event of a true emergency, we want law enforcement, emergency responders getting to the scene first. And hundreds of parents trying to get to our schools at the time that we need those emergency responders getting to our schools is going to create challenges for us. And so we ask, um, and our communication to parents is that, that we want you to wait. We're going to tell you where to go so that you can be most helpful in that circumstance. And again, it's a, it's a way that you help keep our community safer and, and help us get care to children in an emergency. Um, if you have not updated your um, address contact information in our emergency notification system, our infinite campus system, we ask that you do that. That um, if you don't know how to get into the parent portal, call us. We'll help you get logged in and, and update that information, or we'll update that information for you. But in the event of an emergency, again, the school administration is going to be focused on managing student safety. They're going to be talking to the central office, who's going to be responsible for getting that communication out. We know from events that have occurred in schools around our country, and, and not only in schools, that our communication is never going to be as quick as the person who's listening to the police scanner or the person who has their cell phone with them who's texting out a message. We know that. We apologize for that, but it's the reality that we live with today, and we're going to do our very best as soon as we've attended to the safety needs to get communication out to families as quickly as possible. Again, through our notification system, we can simultaneously put out text, voice, and um, email messages. So. We will get that information to you, but please know <laughs> that it might be delayed from what, you know, that may be breaking in on Channel 9 News at the same time that we're trying to get that information out. And again, th this is a difficult topic. I think we acknowledged that earlier this evening. None of us ever want to be in that situation, but we work together really carefully with our local law enforcement, with our um, uh, fire department, with our town administrator, to look at safety plans at the school level, at the district level, so that we are prepared for things that might happen. Every situation is unique. Every situation is dynamic. There's no specific single thing that we can do that is going to prevent um, something from occurring. But we have well-trained staff with good judgment. We have well-trained students. Um, we have good cooperation among our administrative team, our law enforcement, our emergency responders, so that we're going to do everything we can um, to get a good outcome, the best possible outcome in an emergency situation. So I don't want to talk more about that right now. <laughs> but uh, speaking of safety, and you didn't bring it up in your report, but there was a student walkout. Um, oh, students. Uh, very true. <laughs> we're very thoughtful about that piece. I don't know if there are thoughts you want to share about it. I know that students were engaged in um, discussions about how to build community within our schools. They were um, learning about how to contact their legislators and express their voice about their, their feelings around school safety. I don't know what else you would add. Yeah. Um, I was not participating, but you were. It so. was a really great event that I feel brought a lot of students together and kind of helped just perpetuate this idea of we want our school safe and we want to find new ways to help keep those schools safe, whether it be bringing up more conversations about mental health, whether that be just learning how to have interpersonal relationships with people. So. One of the big focuses that we did was 
um, focusing on the 17 students that lost their lives and how we can change that around and find 17 new ways to be nicer to each other, to have a safer school, um, and to have better relationships with the people in our communities, which was, I think, very unique. And it was a really great experience. And we had a state representative there, Senate, or Representative Cahill, which was really great for students to talk to him about new legislation that's going through. And we were able to have a little table about how to get in contact with your state representatives and federal representatives, which was really cool to see kids engaged and learning how to contact their representatives about things that they're passionate about. So it was, I think, very a very productive 17 minutes, which was good. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rizzoni referenced earlier um, some grants that we have applied for and received. One of those um, that will apply to both of our schools is a state training opportunity around what's called universal design for learning. And um, we've talked at the administrative level and they've talked with some folks at the school level. Universal design is, is really exactly what our community talked about when it talked about meeting the needs of all kids. Right? Universal design is essentially philosophical. It's, a, it's this big idea that we have a responsibility to meet the needs of everyone. We do that best when, just like in architecture, you design a building that's accessible for everyone from the beginning. And so the idea when you connect it to learning is about designing instruction that's accessible to as many people as possible from the beginning. So that means building in for different reading levels. It means building in visual support. It means building uh, a, a physical environment that meets the needs of students. So designing your, your classroom um, so that materials are available. So from small to large, but it really is, um, I think, sort of that baseline philosophy for all of us that we have a responsibility to meet the needs of all learners. How can we employ the tools and resources and skills that we have and the content knowledge to bring that to bear for all of our kids. So that training, as we are looking at this competency-based piece, it, it, it's again, I guess you could look at it, I don't know, top, top down, bottom up, but it's the umbrella maybe under which all of these other things falls. Competency-based education falls under that big picture of universal design. How are we planning to meet the needs of all the students that we serve in our schools? And again, we've talked about at, at, at the board level and in these meetings, we haven't always done a great job of meeting the needs of all of our students with disabilities or our students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. We have some performance gaps, achievement gaps for that, that population of students. And so if we look at the big picture and are re kind of re-examining how we do our work to better meet the needs of all of those students from the beginning, again, we're gonna raise everyone up. And so we're excited about that grant. It's a two plus, two and a half year opportunity for us. We'll have um, administrators from both buildings and five or six educators from both buildings involved in first year training teams and then we have an opportunity to bring in a second team of the same size in the second year to also get that training. They'll be doing some work with the whole school. I think they're coming to faculty meetings in May, April or May, um, to talk to the whole faculty about, about that work. And again, it, it feels like it is sort of synthesizing these pieces that we have out there. So that's an exciting <coughs> opportunity for us. And we're working now on some summer PD and applying for some um, uh, reallocations of federal funding that, that has been left over from prior fiscal years that's available. Last year we received some of that to support professional development. We received some to support our summer programming. So we're hopeful that we'll get some of that again and we'll talk with you more about that at a, at a future meeting. And the only other thing that I wanna not forget, um, we have uh, been fortunate to have um, former Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court, um, Justice Roderick, come, um, agree to come and speak to students in our school system about mental health, and um, he uh, began the work in New Hampshire of an organization called Changing Directions, whose mission really is to destigmatize mental health needs. Um, and so he is a, a great speaker. He tells a very personal story about his own experiences and his family's experiences with mental health um, challenges, and we look forward to having our students at the junior senior high hear him 
speak and again continue that conversation about community. Uh, the next thing on our agenda is committee reports. Um, I'll go briefly. We had a uh, health care study committee meeting this afternoon um, and we're still sort of looking at the different options out there for the employees of the district in terms of different companies. We are in the process, Amy Rossi is going to work on sort of combining the, looking at the the big three companies to do a side-by-side -side comparison to see where the, the, the differences are and where the similarities are so we can determine um, next steps um, so that due diligence continues. Um, and we'll meet again in April to review the information. Any other committee reports? Um, <clears throat> on facilities, we, uh, despite the snowstorm last Tuesday, we met, uh, we had a combined meeting and um, approve the guaranteed maximum price, um, which is sort of the last step, I guess, in the design development process. And now um, the um, construction manager, Ekman, can go out and, or they probably have already, uh, secure contracts so we can break ground in April if it melts, the snow melts. <laughs> right, so, as soon as around the time baseball season starts. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so things things are moving along there. Um, there Unless, I, unless something happened the last week, we're still waiting on the state DOT to um, finalize their decision on <coughs> our proposal for, um, I guess, curb cuts and at, at both schools. Um, so um, it's we're waiting on that. Um, but uh, you know, full steam ahead. And just as a general overview on that, the bids that finally came in in the guaranteed maximum price that we talked about earlier in the process are within um, hundreds of dollars of each other. So there were no great surprises cumulatively about any of the budget, which is, uh, I think, a credit to everybody for their due diligence. Um, there, could have, there could have been, and oftentimes is, some pretty uh, wide disparities. But uh, congratulations to everybody that was involved in, in making that happen. <clears throat> can, can I segue back for a second because yes. there are two things I forgot to acknowledge. Please oh, segue. I apologize. So received notifications from SST of some, some of our students who earn certifications in digital design, digital media arts program. So I want to just acknowledge Alex Kumpf um, for graphic design and illustration with Adobe Illustrator and digital video premiere. Again, they're earning industry level certifications in these areas. Um, awesome. Donnie Foltz for graphic design and illustration with Adobe Illustrator. Rich Animated Media using Adobe Animate, Visual Design using Adobe Photoshop, and Ben LeBeau, uh, again, Graphic Design and Illustration with Adobe Illustrator, and Visual Design using Adobe Photoshop. So congratulations to them. Awesome. Uh, also received a note from the Department of Education that they completed their desk review um, of financial information related to our expenditures of federal funds. So. They review that. They were looking at 16, 17 funds. We're no longer required to do single audit because we have less than a half million dollars of federal funds that come through to us. Um, but in their desk review, they reviewed our district financial statements and the auditor's report. They reviewed the federal funds expenditures. Um, and they identified no issues of concern relative the, to the district's management or expenditure of federal grant funds for FY17. So that's great news. That's what you always hope for. And, um, Again, I want to credit our business office for their due diligence on those um, federal projects. The next thing on our agenda sort of goes back to the facilities piece. Um, we spoke a few meetings ago about um, the clerk of the works position, and we decided as a board that it made sense for a variety of reasons um, that I'm not going to go into fully here, but that it made sense for Greg. Um, or who is the um, current of facilities the director of facilities to fulfill the role of clerk of the works? One of the things, one of the challenges with that decision is that there are some responsibilities that he has that will not will sort of be left over when he's focusing on the clerk of the works. So Meredith has provided us with a job description, just a draft, um, for the part-time assistant director of facilities. <laughs> so you know, I think we would take a look at this, Mayor, if you could say anything you want about it now, and then we can um, revisit it at a future meeting to, to adopt it if we choose to or amend it. 
if that makes sense. Sure. So just to remind folks, our facilities director is a shared position with the town. Um, about two thirds of the cost rests with us. About one third with the town, and and time is allocated sort of based on what's going on in a particular week or moment. But as we gear up for the for the school project, we know that during the two-thirds of time, essentially, that is school time, our facilities director is going to be largely um, occupied with overseeing the building project. And so to free him up to do that work, we um, talked again about reallocating those funds held in our bond project for a clerk of the works to uh, provide support to him through the life of the project. So what we have constructed is what we're calling a temporary part-time assistant director of school facilities position. So again, this is a, a, a draft of that position. The position right. would report to um, the director of facilities and would be responsible essentially for all of those facilities related tasks on the school side that the director would do if he were not doing clerk of the works right. um, responsibilities. So overseeing our custodial staff, coordinating, um, purchasing, maintenance, working with contractors, making sure that bills get paid, um, bids go out appropriately, all of those pieces again that our facilities director would do. So. Again, temporary part-time assistant director of school facilities. Job description is out for review. Right. We, our hope is to post this position as anticipated, probably as soon as um, beginning of next week, and then um, ask the board to provide any feedback so that we could bring this back for approval at your next meeting and get that hiring process completed in early April so that, that we can hopefully have someone board someone on board before we move into the heavier construction piece this summer. And again, Meredith Theater, right, to reiterate, this money that's being allocated for this amount is part of the bond project and that's was correct. voted in it, and it's a temporary position for the period of the, the building project. Temporary and part-time for the life of the project. Okay. I've just had an opportunity to go through this quickly. I'm, I'm, surpri I'm, uh, I'm surprised that um, that the person that we're going to be looking for um, is uh, um, has higher qualifications than I thought they would. An associate's degree in facilities management, engineering, technology, five years work experience in building construction, maintenance, and so forth. I thought it was more of a clerical support position, but my my. Uh, my original comments hold true. This is really for you guys to to craft. And the fact I'm surprised it shouldn't. I, I I'm glad you're doing what you're doing because it shows thought. Right. Um, and um, and I think I think it helps with the loop. I mean, we we have this outstanding issue out there in terms of if we decide, which we did, that Greg was going to be the clerk of the works. What happened to the other two yep. thirds of his job? And this is that loop they yep. closed. So, yeah. I just want to note that it's associate's degree or five years of experience. Right. Um, but yes, to your point, we are looking for someone who has the facilities level experience more yeah. than clerical support. Yeah, and as we've exactly. looked really closely at the needs, yep. the the collective judgment Makes was that was me. what would yeah. be most beneficial. Thank you for. Uh, no, thanks for thanks yeah. for keeping us on yeah. the loop. And, um, salary based on experience is it a salary position or will it be hourly or it will be an hourly position it. it's a part-time so it's a 32 hour week um, so there would be you know potentially some prorated benefits available yeah. and, a, and an hourly rate yeah. and again our, our current budget is a hundred thousand dollars for the life of the project so we would be doing our best to, to stay within that budget yeah right. that's what we got yeah 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 yeah, yeah. No, good good thank you good work um, the next item on the agenda is a school board retreat. Um, you know, I think I'm sort of going to defer this picking dates until we have the other two people with us. <laughs> but just so you guys know where I am, I've reached out to Bear Christina from the School Board Association to come to talk with us for specific topics. Um, and we can talk as a group. I have some ideas from what those can be. We can sort of brainstorm some stuff. I think we can benefit from his the night that he came to talk about responsibilities. I think we all learned a lot, and I think we could learn a lot from him again. 
So that's where that sort of is. Um, the We talked at the last joint town and school board meeting about having another one in the springtime. Dale and I have been in communication and with Meredith and Steve as well, and May 7th is the tentative date that has been put on the calendar for that meeting. Um, and unless um, there's a compelling reason, I think it's going to happen that day. So Good. you could add that to that calendar. Um, you know, I, I, it, it, I, it's been great um, for me as a chair last year, working with Dale as a, the chair of the, the town council. Um, you know, sharing information as well as sharing services, but just having the, that line of communication between the two boards, I think, is invaluable to the town. So thank you, Dale, for that. Um, the next thing is approval of the minutes. The February 22nd minutes we cannot approve right now because we do not have a quorum of people that were there because I was not there for that meeting, so we will defer that to next time. But we can approve the March 13th public meeting minutes from the meeting that you just described, Mike, last week. I seek a motion to approve the school board meeting minutes from the meeting on March 13th. So moved. Do I have a second for that motion? Second. And a motion for Mr. Zink and a second for Mr. Kennison to approve the March 13th, 2018 um, public meetings. Yeah. Are there any amendments to the, to the minutes? All those in favor of approving them say aye. 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 Minutes approved. Um, Al, do you have the manifest handly? Handy? handly. Uh, I do. <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion to approve the payroll and AP manifests of March 22nd, 2018, payroll manifest in the amount of $502,716.62. Accounts payable manifest in the amount of $582,484.21. Uh, bond manifest in the amount of $145,545.11 for a total of a million $234,745.94. I seek a second. Second. For a motion from Mr. Zink and a second from Mr. Kenton to approve the manifest as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 The next item is the approval of the 2018-2019 calendar. Um, we There had been talk at the beginning of the calendar process of moving to an hours model and we had played around with some things but what you'll see and what's online for approval is a more traditional calendar it's just sort of pushing the start date back until after labor day um, but the rest of it seems to be in line with what we've had in the past um, any questions about that calendar hearing none i seek a motion to approve the calendar for the um the district calendar for the 2018-2019 school year so moved second motion for mr zink a second for mr kennison to approve the district calendar for 2018-2019 any discussion hearing none I'm mixing up the names you need a chocolate i probably do <laughs> you guys are keeping me up too late no i need another diet coke um all those in favor say aye aye, aye. Meredith, one question I had around dates is, do we have a graduation date? We're not out of snow season yet. That's what I was afraid you would say. So I will not disclose a graduation <laughs> date at this time. I prefer to hedge my bets until after April vacation. Can you at least tell us what month it will be in? <laughs> well, I expect it to still be in June. Oh, okay, please. I am, I am going to, <laughs> I am going uh, to I, I would say we're on our fifth snow day. Were there to be no more snow days, our graduation date would be its traditional week before um, gra student, the school year would normally end. Yeah. And so, uh, again, with no further changes, that, I that date is I'm unlikely to change. I'm going to edit <laughs> this part of the meeting and send it to my family members afar because they <laughs> keep not believing me when I say we don't have a date. So if you say it, then we'll, well be better off. Okay. <laughs> All right. The next thing is to approve some generous donations that we've received from two sources, NCE, NCEP, who is always a good supporter, an excellent supporter of the schools, and we're grateful for them, and the Harmon Foundation. Uh, the donations total $4,875, but I'll just give a brief detail of, of, of them. The first one is one um, for a thousand dollar grant to the SAU requested and, and received by uh, Assistant Superintendent and Assistant Superintendent Andrisky 
for um, student personalization and teacher professional development. And then two went to the elementary school, one for um, Lanigan for the Go Noodle subscription of $1,000. And the other is for uh, Linda Hopi and Nancy Miller for the $875 for the Hydro Rain Mini Garden Tower. Um, one of the things that's neat about the elementary school is the whole garden club, and I guess this is taking the garden club to the next level, so we're excited about that. So the total amount for NCEP are $2,875. And then we received a $2,000 um, fund for an ESOL scholarship. Um, that will be utilized for those things. We are always grateful for the, the donations we receive. Um, and I seek a motion to approve the donations in the amount of $4,875. So moved. Second. And a motion from Mr. Kennison and a second from Mr. Zink to approve our donations in the amount of $4,875. Is there any discussion? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the support. Um, hearing no further discussion, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of accepting these generous donations, please say aye. 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 They're accepted. Thank you very much. And going back to Al's point about graduation requirements and making sure that people have fundamental things, we have a policy to discuss. And Meredith, you could take us through that in terms of graduation requirements for high school. Okay. And I will note that Assistant Superintendent Andrisky is here and has worked with this as well. Um, essentially, we are, are updating our graduate graduation requirements for students moving forward to reflect the changes that Mr. Mazzoni outlined today. Writing will no longer be a, a standalone additional requirement for credits of English is still required. Um, that is probably the biggest change that, that you see here. We still require 28 and a quarter credits. Um, writing is still available. <laughs> We're not taking it away. Um, but four credits of English seems to be pretty standard with, with all of our counterparts around and it's very consistent with what colleges require. So you see that change. Um, yours is in red and mine is not, so if I'm missing anything. Um, we also have some changes that, that came through from the state around what's called a, a state diploma. So that is a, a lesser credit requirement than what we require to provide a new market diploma, but students can earn in Newmarket, a 20 credit diploma that meets those state requirements. And so we would endorse that they have met those credits and they can graduate with that diploma. Um, uh, and you see the required graduation competencies by content areas laid out there that, again, that aligns with what the state requires. And so we've just clarified uh, mathematics, for example, algebra continues to be a, a requirement for students within the state. There's also now a newly um, defined alternate diploma mm -hmm. under the state, and um, and it's just clarified that that doesn't end a student's eligibility right. for special education. So, um, and my so the, my the understanding highlights. of that, which is limited, but mm -hmm. uh, the way I perceived it was a student could graduate with the state defined alternative diploma at 18, but still receive special ed services to 21. Correct, and that's, again, you're typically looking at, at students with some of our most significant disabilities, perhaps some cognitive disabilities, who are going to continue to receive um, training and support and transition okay. um, coaching and guidance through the school system and related services. So okay. that's a decision the IEP team would make. It's not a decision that any of us unilaterally make, right. but the IEP team would recommend that, and the student would be able to walk with his or her graduating class and then continue to receive those supports while they qualified under special education. I think that's great. So am I correct, Mary, it's that, that Newmarket requires a 28 and a quarter credits for graduation. The state requires 20? The state requirements, the minimum requirements for a state level diploma are 20 credits. And I would say most school districts require a, a, somewhere in that range of 28. It depends on whether they run a block schedule model or a more traditional model. Um, but most are in the sort of 24 to 28 credit range. It's a huge difference. Uh, any sense of why there's such a, a deviation? Um, so there's a long history to that. 
But if you look at some of the major differences, um, they require one credit in physical science and one credit in biological yeah. science. Only three credits in mathematics. We're asking students to earn four credits in mathematics. We yeah. ask for three credits in science. Um, we, they have six open electives. We have 11. Um, we're, the foundational pieces are fairly consistent. Again, we have a little bit more rigor in both the math, math and sciences in terms of our expectations for students when they graduate. The elective piece is, again, um, partly a reflection of the fact that we offer our courses in an every other day model so that students are able to take um, the equivalent of seven credits. Well, actually, they can take more than that. They can take eight credits um, per year. And so they could earn a maximum of 32. But we want to give them, to, to the point that you were discussing earlier, the opportunity to make choices, to have some opportunities to explore different pathways and career opportunities. and. Um, areas of interest that might serve them well as they move forward into their future. And, but it's it's not only opportunity, it's a requirement yes. that mm -hmm. they explore Correct. elective opportunities above 20. Yes. Gotcha. And, um, and world language is a great example. I, you have right now five credits in <laughs> world language. Correct? Yes. Um, and that's not a requirement under a state diploma, but it but there's a pretty good argument to be made that going out into the world today, ha having fluency or at least a good command of a second language is a really valuable skill. Now, with the um, civics exam, is that something that's going to apply to the class of 2022? I have to look at that specifically and see how it is related. Well, we already have those civics requirements embedded in our our junior courses, okay. and so it's part of the assessments they already are taking in those classes. It's not a standalone okay. assessment right now. It's it's assessing whether or not they meet those competencies Within that through curriculum. those cor okay. courses. Okay. So that is our first reading of that. Yes. And it will be back with us at the next meeting for the second reading. Or perhaps the one after. Or perhaps the one after, <laughs> depending on how, because we are I'm pushing a lot of things to the next meeting. Um, the next thing we need to go into non-public to discuss personnel matters under RS, well, I'll, I'll ask for a motion nice. in a second. But um, our next school board meeting will be April 5th. Um, and is there anything else that I'm forgetting? I don't think so. Or subsequent meetings? I think that's subsequent, the next one. The next one will be on the 5th, and then the 19th after that. And we'll be back on our normal schedule because it's not impact with the breaks. So I seek a motion to go into non public. So moved. Under RSA 91A32B. Motion for Mr. Zink. Second. Second for Mr. Kinnison. We'll take an alt roll call vote. Mr. Zink? Aye. Mr. Kinnison? Aye. Ms. Shelton, we are in non public at 8. 45 p.m. Okay, make sure your mics are. Yes. Switched. Yeah, hey, Ted, we're uh, all set. We're going into non public right now. Thank you. Jen, thank you for my gift. So sweet. I might have turned around.